The West sold its last remaining property in the land of reality about 10 years ago, and we've been renting a party house in the Upside Down ever since. Every day in America is opposite day. We're claiming that we live in a racist country that's more dangerous for black people than the antebellum South. We claim to care about keeping our children safe while we chemically castrate them. But is there change in the air? This week, the UK released a 400-page report on the state of gender care for children, and it's about as damning as you'd expect. Here in the States, a longtime senior editor at National Public Radio has written an expose on the total leftist and Democrat woke capture of the public broadcasting network. It's April 13th, 2024. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens. We'll talk about all these topics and more this week on Disaffected. So the big story this week is the release of what's called the Cass Review in England. Led up by Dr. Hilary Cass, who is a pediatrician in the National Health Service in England, this is the long-awaited report on the state of gender-affirming care and research with a focus on what's being done to children in England's NHS. <clears throat> now, it is a 388-page report. I have not had time to read it carefully. I have read through it. I've skimmed. I've read a couple of summaries. I'm relying um, for guidance on the summary from the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine. Having seen their work product before, I judge them to be accurate. Here are the major themes in that report. Number one, weak to non-existent evidence from poorly conducted studies and trials about the so-called benefits or risks of social and medical transitioning of children. Here's a reference to social transition in the report. And the first thing to notice about this is how ill-defined that term is. Quote, there's no single definition of social transition, but it is broadly understood to, re to refer to social changes to live as a different gender, such as altering hair or clothing, name change, and or different use of pronouns, or use of different pronouns. So, dyeing one's hair now changes one's sex. What would that mean? <laughs> Using a different pronoun changes one's sex? What, how? And what actually is considered gender non-conforming in 2024? Another point brought out in the report, early social transition, so treating a child as the opposite sex from an early age and publicly, that seems to lock in the later medicalization of these children. Quote, the systematic review showed no clear evidence that social transition in childhood has any positive or negative mental health outcomes and relatively weak evidence for any effect in adolescence. However, those who had socially transitioned at an earlier age and or prior to being seen in a clinic were more likely to proceed to a medical pathway. Now, it seems obvious to me that enabling a delusion in a child is a negative mental health outcome. We do not need, that's one thing I wanna say about this. I'm a little frustrated, not, not, at the, not at the team who put together the report, but the fact that we have to have this report and we have to discuss it as if it's showing us things that we could not have known without the report. And of course it is showing us some of those things. They have gone through these studies and looked at the methodology in a scientific way. We do need that information. But us, regular people out on the street, voters in England, in the United States, we don't need a study to tell us that it is harmful to cut a child's dick off, to cut a child's breasts off, to collude with a child with a delusion, a psychiatric delusion that they are the opposite sex. 
Where's the evidence? What does the study say? Do you need a study to tell you not to stick your hand on a hot stove burner? Do you need to be told that by a study? That's where we are. This is where we are as a society. I don't know, there's no data on that. I don't know if plunging a knife into her heart would hurt her, Kalhar. What does the study say? <laughs> I was going to say that's retarded, but that's so freaking far beyond retarded. I don't know what the word is for it. All right, back to the report. There's been a huge, so allegedly unexplained increase in the number of girls who are referred for gender care. It used to be mostly boys, and it was a very small cohort. Um, traditionally, historically, traditionally, since the late 20th century, when all this nonsense got started by that pedophile researcher, John Money, who came up with the uh, definition and the idea of gender identity, um, really almost the only children who were ever diagnosed with something like what we call gender dysphoria was a very, very small cohort of boys. But look at how the numbers have changed over the past couple of years. We're going to put this graphic up on the screen, and you'll see that sharp rise in the curve. But I realize that this is too small for you to read. So we pulled out some data. And here's what it says. Next graphic, please, Kevin. 2009, the number of minor girls referred to a clinic for gender treatment was 17, one seven. By 2016, the number of minor girls referred for gender treatment was 1,209. So from 17 to 1,209 over a period of seven years. In 2009, the number of minor boys referred for gender treatment was 34. In 2016, the number was 557. So a huge increase as well, but the really astonishing increase is the number of girls who have overtaken the boys. I mean, it's a huge increase for both, but with, with the girls, I don't think this is unexplained at all. It's simply, trans is the new way to be anorexic, and it's the new way to self-harm by cutting yourself. It's borderline behavior. It's borderline personality trauma behavior. If it were Salem in 1692, it would be possession by witches. It's simply the new way for psychiatrically troubled adolescent girls to be psychiatrically troubled. Then the report talks about the widespread adoption across the West of the Dutch protocol, which says that it's best to block puberty in kids early so that they don't develop normal sexed body characteristics. This allows the use later of cross-sex hormones to give them a better appearance of having developed cross-sex characteristics. So all of this is in the service of, of better passing, visually passing. The idea behind the Dutch protocol of early children is, it is simply about making the children pass more easily. But this is based on the concerns of adult transsexuals and fetishists. Adult transsexuals have very poor mental health, and it is not alleviated by so-called gender-affirming care. The data shows that, and we would already know that by common sense. So many of these adult transsexuals claim that their mental health is, isn't better because they can't easily pass as the opposite sex, and so therefore they're being picked on and stigmatized and embarrassed, and it's all of that stress of not being seen as the sex they want to be seen that makes their mental health poor. Not true. They were crazy first. So the idea is that the, by doing this, we're helping children by making sure that they don't develop their normal sexed bodies, and then we can use hormones on them to sculpt an approximation of the opposite sex. Do you remember that old parody website, Bonsai Kitten? Um, it was a joke. People got upset about it. But uh, the, the conceit was that you put kittens, small kittens, inside of glass jars to force them to grow into a certain shape, as, as one does when pruning a bonsai tree. That's what's happening to these children, except that it's not a hoax and it's not funny. The idea of the transgender child is the ultimate retcon. It's a fictional origin story written ex post facto 
by adult transsexuals to make their mental sickness seem natural and inborn by saying, look, here's a child who was just like me because I've been this way since I was a little kid. It is utterly grotesque. It's clear also from this report that transing kids is simply transing away the gay. These are proto-gay children who end up being same-sex attracted. This is the real conversion therapy. The report cites a 2011 study of a cohort of 70 minors whose puberty was blocked early. That is, it was actually blocked before puberty. Uh, quote, of the 70 patients, 89% were same-sex attracted to their birth registered sex, that is their real sex, with most of the rest being bisexual. Only one patient was exclusively heterosexual. Now, we already know that kids who are given puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones have a very high likelihood of early onset osteoporosis, early onset heart disease, cancer, infertility, that is, they can never have children, and early death. This report, the CAST review, recommends that the health system in England treat gender-confused kids the same way that all patients are assessed and treated. Thorough assessment that takes into account all physical and mental problems and comorbidities and uses talk psychotherapy as the primary treatment. No more puberty blockers, no more cross-sex hormones for kids. This past week, England announced that the National Health Service will no longer prescribe or allow puberty blockers or hormones for kids under 18. So the trans kid, that fiction is ending in England. But how long will it take the United States to stop this? I doubt, we're not going to see a federal ban here. It doesn't work that way in this country. We'll probably have to see that happen state by state as it's happening now. And unfortunately, lawsuit by lawsuit, because that is the only thing that really speaks and moves power in this country, is monetary lawsuits. And of course, regardless of how many experimented on children win these lawsuits, it won't give them back their whole bodies and it won't take away the psychological trauma of what they were put through. The absolute worst medical scandal in Western history, not recent history, in all of history. The only other place that this went on with such abandon were the German death camps. And I'm not joking, I mean that literally. This is Joseph Mengele stuff, always has been, and everyone knows it. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. National Public Radio, the delicious dish. <laughs> Waking up to realize that you've been going along with a lot of lies and untruths is a constant theme on this show. I talk about it all the time. And one of those realizations is that the media lies constantly about everything. And very often they're telling you the exact opposite of the truth. And if they're not directly lying, they're leaving out important context. They're lying by omission. They're leaving out anything that contradicts what they would like to be true and what they would like you to perceive to be true. This is happening to a senior editor at National Public Radio named Uri Berliner. He wrote an explosive essay this past week on the network. Um, telling on the network, and he wrote this for Barry Weiss's publication, The Free Press, which is on Substack. I got to give him this. He starts out by admitting that he's a typical NPR person. Quote, you know the stereotype of the NPR listener, an electric vehicle driving, wordle playing, tote bag carrying coastal elite. It doesn't precisely describe me, but it's not far off. I'm a Sarah Lawrence educated, hey, Uri. I'm a Sarah Lawrence educated, I'm Sarah Lawrence Educated, was raised by a lesbian peace activist mother. I drive a Subaru and Spotify says my listening habits are most similar to people in Berkeley. <laughs> oh, oh, Uri. Uri Berliner accuses NPR, his employer, of being beholden to basically all ideas woke. Systemic racism, the idea that Russia helped elect Trump, that the Hunter Biden laptop was a fake story, COVIDianism. Now, none of this is a revelation to those of us who are looking in from the outside, but it's surprising to see a working NPR editor admit it in print. 
And yes, of course, we wonder how much longer he'll be working there. I don't think it'll be very long. Uri Berliner points out the leftward lurch that NPR took particularly in the 20-teens. Quote, back in 2011, although NPR's audience tilted a bit to the left, it still bore a resemblance to America at large. 26% of listeners described themselves as conservative, 23% as middle of the road, and 37% as liberal. Quote, by 2023, the picture was completely different. Only 11% described themselves as very or somewhat conservative, 21% as middle of the road, and 67% of listeners said they were very or somewhat liberal. We weren't just losing conservatives, we were also losing moderates and traditional liberals. Now, Berliner blames Donald Trump himself or the election of Donald Trump for, quote, the rise in advocacy at NPR. But that was NPR's own choice. NPR took those actions. Donald Trump didn't make them take those actions. And it didn't just start in 2016 either. It definitely went into overdrive in 2016, very noticeably, yes. But Uri is fooling himself, and I think he knows this, um, to say that everything was hunky-dory at NPR right before 2016. It wasn't. He also calls the Russiagate conspiracy catnip that drove NPR's reporting. He claims NPR relied on House Representative Adam Schiff too much, you know him of the bug eyes, interviewing Adam Schiff 25 times during the Russiagate non-story and allowing him to become what Berliner calls the network's muse. Well, then the Robert Mueller report came out and found no evidence of Russian collusion in the 2016 election, and Berliner notes that NPR just let the story fade away without any self-correction at all. Quote, it is one thing to swing and miss on a major story. Unfortunately, it happens. You follow the wrong leads, you get misled by sources you trusted. You're emotionally invested in a narrative, and bits of circumstantial evidence never add up. It's bad to blow a big story. He continues, quote, What's worse is to pretend it never happened, to move on with no mea culpas, no self-reflection, especially when you expect high standards of transparency from public figures and institutions, but don't practice those standards yourself. That's what shatters trust and engenders cynicism around the media. Yeah, he's right about that. And it's a lesson that none of the legacy media have learned. If they would just admit that they were wrong or that they made a mistake and indicate even a little willingness to reconsider their prior assumptions and biases that led them astray, but none of them will do it. Here's the headline from NPR in response. NPR defends its journalism after senior editor says it has lost the public's trust by David Fulkenflick. I still know all their names. Quote, we are proud to stand behind the exceptional work that our desks and shows do to cover a wide range of challenging stories. We believe that inclusion in, among our staff, with our sources, and in our overall coverage is critical to telling the nuanced story. Nuanced stories of this country and our world. That's NPR Chief News Executive Edith Chapin. Now, Uri Berliner cites a number of familiar topics that NPR fudged. Russiagate, the Hunter Biden laptop, the probable Wuhan lab origin of COVID. And the last topic is a good illustration of how Democrat politics have completely captured the nation's public broadcaster. Quote, but at NPR, we weren't about to swivel or even tiptoe away from the insistence with which we backed the natural origin story. He's referring to COVID. We didn't budge when the Energy Department, the federal agency with the most expertise about laboratories and biological research, concluded, albeit with low confidence, that a lab leak was the most likely explanation for the emergence of the virus. Next quote, when a colleague on our science desk was asked why they were so dismissive of the lab leak theory, the response was odd. The colleague compared it to the Bush administration's unfounded argument that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction, apparently meaning we won't get fooled again. But these two events were not even remotely related. Again, politics were blotting out the curiosity and independence that ought to have been driving our work. Berliner blames a lot of the more recent problems at NPR on their chief executive officer, John Lansing. Lansing 
completely bought into the systemic racism BLM logic, and he sent memos out to staff talking about how nothing was more important than diversity. Here's a quote from one of those memos. When it comes to identifying and ending systemic racism, we can be agents of change. Listening and deep reflection are necessary but not enough. They must be followed by constructive and meaningful steps forward. I will hold myself accountable for this. Look at the good you do, John. Unsurprisingly, everything took a backseat to race after that. I'll read you a little bit more from his story. Race and identity became paramount in nearly every aspect of the workplace. Journalists were required to ask everyone we interviewed their race, gender, and ethnicity, among other questions. Yeah, like pronouns, right, Uri? I noticed you didn't get that in there. And we had to enter it into a centralized tracking system. We were given unconscious bias training sessions. A growing DEI staff offered regular meetings and imploring us to start talking about race. Monthly dialogues were offered for, quote, women of color and, quote, men of color. Non-binary people of color were included, too. Now, Berliner documents how NPR staff are told not to use correct terms that relate to biological sex. That's actually an order in favor of gender terms um, and how every war and conflict um, Ah, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, not, I'm having a hard time reading my own notes. <laughs> um, he also talks about how, how every war, but particularly the war between Israel and Hamas, is thought of at NPR in terms of oppressor, oppressed, total good guy, total bad guy. Basically, NPR reported from an insider like Uri Berliner sounds like exactly what we've all been seeing from the outside. And how could it not? I mean, <laughs> Berliner looked up the voter registration records of all 87 people in the newsroom he works in, and he found that every single one of them was a registered Democrat. There were zero Republicans and zero conservatives in his newsroom. And of course, he's sad about the decline at NPR, and I can't blame him. He hopes they'll go back to real journalism, but he says that he's been rebuffed every time he's been he's brought up these issues over the past several years. He says he's now a visible wrong thinker at work. Well, I've been there, lots of luck. Okay, it's time for a break, but before we go, I wanna remind you, do you need to talk to someone? If you need somebody to bounce off a situation that's abusive or troubling in your life, you can talk to me. You can book a one hour session with me at joshuaslocum.net if you need a sounding board for issues about narcissism, fractured families, problems at work or in academia, bullying, and more. I'd love to help you see your situation more clearly and walk through your options so that you have a realistic idea of what your plan will be and what the likely consequences are. And supporting disaffected members also get a discount. So if you need an ear, book me, joshuaslocum.net, and we'll see you after the break. something from Disaffected you don't find anywhere else? Well, you can help produce the show. Supporting members get access to our private Discord chat server, meetups, and audio episode recording sessions with guests. Sign up at disaffectedpod.substack.com or at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. I almost think this show needs a regular feature on the state of the race mythology that we're living under in America, because we've completely lost our minds about it. In the 90s, most of us, black people and white people, thought the race problem had pretty much been solved. Racism was rarely discussed. People mixed much more than they do today. After Obama's election in 2008, it all started falling apart. We became convinced that racism in America was just as bad in the 21st century as it was before the Civil Rights Act. Systemic racism entered our vocabulary and it never left. Just like we believe trans 
people are everywhere. We believe anti-black racism infests every church, every corner store, and for sure every white person's mind. We became convinced that cops were murdering unarmed black teens and men by the thousands, and that was never true. We were told that aggressors, like Michael Brown, were innocent childlike boys gunned down by racist neighborhood patrol members and cops. Did you know that Michael Brown, hands up, don't shoot? Michael Brown, for <laughs> he grappled with the cop who was trying to arrest him, physically grappled with him, and he tried to take the cop's gun out of his hands. And he never surrendered with his hands up. He didn't, didn't happen. He also didn't say hands up, don't shoot. That was never true. Did you know that? I didn't until recently. It was all a lie. And the riots in Ferguson, Missouri, over Michael Brown's 2014 shooting by Officer Darren Wilson were over nothing because the shooting was justified. You're going to grapple with a cop and try to grab his gun. He's going to shoot you. What do you think you would do? Were you that cop or were you a person who was being come after by somebody like a Michael Brown? But the script was written, and it gave us many others, uh, including, of course, St. George Floyd. Almost everything we tell ourselves about allegedly anti-black racism in this country is the exact opposite of the truth. Young black men are more likely by far than white people to commit violent crime and to be victims of it by other black men. Police kill only about 20 unarmed black male suspects every year, not thousands, not even hundreds. And when you look at the details of these cases, most of them appear to be justified shooting by cops who are facing criminal suspects who disobey orders or try to kill the police officer. We saw it just the other day, just the other day, yesterday, or the day before. Young black man gets pulled over by a group of cops. He's not wearing his seatbelt. They go over. He's got big tinted windows. Then they discover he's got a gun doesn't want to roll the windows down. He shoots at the damned cops and then they shoot him because of course they do. He shoots at them. He hit one of the cops. One of the cops was black. What do we hear from the media? 96 bullet fired. Police kill unarmed black. Oh, sorry, not unarmed. He had a knife and a gun. Very first thing out of their mouths. Kill unarmed black man. It's, it's not funny. I can't even make fun of this. It is so destructive and dangerous. Partially as a result of these lies, these race myths that we believe, we've watched states loosen their drug and crime laws so that black people are not disproportionately impacted. Notice how even the perpetrators are talked about as if they are the passive victims, impacted. We've lowered public school standards to the points where kids in some states can graduate with, while being actually illiterate and actually innumerate. Teachers across the country are facing violent and aggressive kids and teens, disproportionately black kids and teens, who are assaulting and beating the piss out of students and teachers. They're not allowed to punish them effectively or expel them because that's racist. And of course, the welfare state, the Great Society, started by President Lyndon Johnson, has helped break apart the family, and it has absolutely destroyed black families. The welfare system financially rewards single mothers and economically punishes families that have a working father or an able-bodied male in the home. We know that single motherhood and absent or deadbeat fathers, we know what this does to kids. Addiction, behavioral problems, mental illness, propensity to crime, these are far more common behaviors among kids who come from homes like this. The public school system may be failing, but the family failed first and hardest. And all of this was in my mind when I came across this story about a new policy at Massachusetts General slash Brigham and Women's Hospital, which now has been mashed together and must be called awkwardly Mass General Brigham. Updating system policies to address inequities and support families impacted by substance use. Can you guess what's coming? Can you guess the policy? bet you can. 
Opening paragraph, as part of our United Against Racism effort to achieve health equity for patients and communities across our system, we've prioritized health conditions with the greatest racial disparities and outcomes and are addressing policies that may unwittingly perpetuate structural racism. Substance use disorder, SUD, is a condition with significant racial and ethnic inequities, especially in the context of pregnancy, when more punitive approaches to substance use disproportionately affect capital B black individuals. Studies, including some within our system, have found that capital B black pregnant people are more likely to be drug tested and to be reported to the child welfare system than lowercase w white pregnant people. Yeah, I inserted the uppercase and lowercase because I want you to hear it. <laughs> So it starts off with a bang. This is a press release from the hospital. We have substance use disorder, the new euphemism for drunkenness and drug addiction. It's a medical problem that they done suffer from, see? You're a victim. Then we have the claim of structural racism and inequities, which means that anytime more black people experience anything, it's because somebody did a racist to them. Then we have pregnant people, because women and mothers don't exist. Then we have the implication that because pregnant black women are tested for drugs more often and get reported to child abuse authorities more often than white mothers, that means they're being unfairly targeted simply and only because they're black. We don't even pretend anymore that it might be the behavior and the choices of such mothers that provoke the testing and reporting. Can you guess yet what the new policy is? First, we have to set the stage. Well, rather, uh, Mass General Brigham has to set the stage. More from their press release. Quote, According to Dr. Wakeman, several values emerged from that report, notably the assertion that having substance use disorder during pregnancy is not by itself child abuse or neglect. So you got, you got that? Being a drug addict while you're pregnant is not abusive or neglectful to the child. I, th I think that's only if you're a black mother, though. White mothers must, of course, never have a single sip of wine, a drag from a cigarette, or more than one cup of coffee. And the states are helping. Next quote. For example, New Mexico changed its law to specify that substance use on its own is not considered abuse or neglect. Connecticut has specified that in instances where there is substance abuse exposure without concern for abuse and neglect, healthcare professionals complete what is known as a plan of safe care and provide notification of the birth without reporting for child abuse or neglect, end quote. And well, here's what Mass General Brigham is doing about it. To that end, Mass General Brigham's new policy launching this month makes several changes for providers. First, the new policy requires written consent for toxicology testing of any pregnant individual or infant outside of emergent situations. I have no idea what emergent situations might be. At the same time, it limits toxicology testing to circumstances where results will change the medical management of the pregnant person or infant. Next quote. The policy also notes that an abuse or neglect report to state child welfare agencies in Massachusetts and New Hampshire after delivery should be filed only if there is a reasonable cause to believe the infant is suffering or at imminent risk of suffering physical or emotional injury and that substance exposure alone, including treatment with methadone or buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, does not require a report of abuse or neglect in the absence of protective concerns for the infant, end quote. God, they need better writers. Hmm. It would be one thing if I believed them, that they wouldn't punish mothers who were genuinely trying to kick a drug habit. The state care system, the foster care system, is no picnic for children. And if a mother and child can be kept together while getting the mother healthy and preventing abuse to the child, so much the better. But I don't believe them. No one should believe them. There's no reason to believe them. Given our collective insanity and given the savior fantasies of upper white, upper class white people, especially upper class white people in medicine and especially upper class white women in medicine, 
it's most likely that they're going to overlook drug addiction and child neglect in black mothers, therefore leaving those children at severe risk with no reporting. That's what they're going to do. Because they love black people that much. Oh, and bonus, it will help the statistics too. They didn't say this, but I thought of it all on my own. If child neglect is not reported to state authorities, then next year we'll be told that child abuse and neglect itself is actually dropping. They're already doing this with the crime stats in dangerous cities like New York. If you never charge the perpetrator and you never convict him, you can say the statistics show that crime is down. And that's what they're doing. When are we going to stop this? Can we stop it? What would it take for us to get over our fantasies about racism and actually, truly, see every American citizen as a human and not an avatar of a demographic identity category? I fear that it's going to be like the parents of so-called trans children. We are so deeply emotionally and politically invested in this fantasy that we may not be able to give it up. Giving it up would mean confronting how wrong we've been and how we acted in the worst interests of our fellow, fellow citizens while telling everyone how very much good we were doing. Not many people are going to be able or willing to do that. All right, time for another break. And as you know, we don't have advertisers or sponsors, but we do have you, our audience, and we appreciate you. Will you help us make the show? There are several ways to throw some dollars in the jar. Um, if you want to help support us on a regular basis, two ways to do it. You can subscribe at disaffectedpod.substack.com or at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. And monthly supporting members get access to our Discord chat server. And this past week, um, by the way, watch your audio coming up this week. Um, make sure that you subscribe to us on your podcast player because we've got an interview, an hour-long interview, and then audience Q&A with Ty King, a former member of Antifa, who was on our show last week and then joined us for a more in-depth conversation uh, over audio. So that's what you um, that's what you get access to if you support us every month. Don't want to do a monthly subscription? We get it. You want to throw a couple bucks in and help us out on a one-time basis? Simply go to disaffected.com and click on support us. We'll see you after the break. Do you get something from Disaffected you don't find anywhere else? Well, you can help produce the show. Supporting members get access to our private Discord chat server, meetups, and audio episode recording sessions with guests. Sign up at disaffectedpod.substack.com or at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Welcome back. I was going to call this um, this block of the show Potpourri to Mockery, but then Kevin would have to go into the closet, get out the graphic, wash it and iron it, get the music all ready. Ain't nobody have time for that this week, honey. So let's just roll our eyes and have some fun to close out the show with a grab bag of nonsense from the inner tubes. First up, this. <laughs> this is from a publication called Queer Majority, and it says... 60% of men have fantasized about being pegged, but stigma, fear, and insecurity prevent most guys from trying it. Really. And the picture here, for those of you on audience, the title is The Ins and Outs of Pegging, Getting Over the Hump. And we've got sassy, afro, young, hip, urban black girl who's ready to peg ya surrounded by floating dildos on harnesses. Really, we are to believe that a majority of men's, most of them straight, fantasize about getting a strap-on dildo shoved up their butts by their wives and girlfriends. Really. 
And it's only insecurity that stops them from doing it. <laughs> Certainly not being disgusted by the thought of their girlfriend pulling a <laughs> putting on a, a belt with a knob on it and knocking at their backsides. Right. Oh, and also there's actually a queer majority anywhere. <laughs> you know, this, this is, bothers me so much. This is deliberate demoralization and deliberate humiliation of straight men. It is deliberate, and that is why they're doing this. Look at the choice of model and, and, and the graphic. The message is, you want a young, sassy, black girlfriend who has replicas of enormous penises cast in silicone, ready to penetrate you. That's what you want. This stinks of libertine gay men working out their own sexual fantasies by projecting them onto straight men, as gay men have been doing forever. You're homophobic. That means you really want it. Ugh. There's a, there's a lot of that around. Have you noticed how, in the past 10 years, the most extreme sexual behaviors that are common to gay men have been pushed onto everyone and made part of mainstream culture? I sure have. Straight men and women, hell, teens, teens included, are now expected to be into sadomasochism, rough and violent sex, sex where you're blitzed out of your mind on drugs, getting choked, gang bangs, open relationships, and more. You know, I'm, I'm actually, I'm interested in hearing from you. Especially, I mean, I'm interested in hearing from normie straight audience members about this topic. We, w tell, me, tell me how this looks to you, please. Leave a comment under this video if you have noticed this shift in what sexual behaviors you as a regular, everyday, normal, ordinary heterosexual are supposed to indulge in, be intrigued by, or approve of. And I'll, I want to hear from every. I, I don't know, I was going to say I'm especially interested in whether straight men notice this, but I don't care if you're a man or woman. I just want to know if you've noticed it. So um, start the conversation under the video. Thank you. Now, on the inappropriate topic of the sexuality of minors, I, I, I cannot believe I'm having to say this. Let's take a look at a bill that was proposed in Rhode Island a year and a half ago. Now, the bill failed, but it was proposed. I won't be at all shocked if it comes back somewhere in the next few years and gets signed into law. The bill added, we're going to show it to you on the screen, the bill added the following text, the following requirements to state law on public school sex ed. Quote, provided further, courses in family life or sex education shall be appropriate for students of all races, genders, sexual orientations, ethnic and cultural backgrounds, and shall affirmatively recognize pleasure-based sexual relations different sexual orientations, and be inclusive of same-sex relationships in discussions and examples. In addition, comprehensive course instruction shall include gender, gender expression, gender identities, and the harm of negative gender stereotypes. Now, here's a brief video of sponsor State Senator Tiara Mack discussing the bill. Saying, focusing our attention on our young people and guaranteeing them all a quality education, which includes comprehensive, queer inclusive, pleasure based sexual health curriculum. What are we discussing with these children? We will be talking in an age appropriate and safe space with our young people about masturbation. We will be talking about all the different ways um, that they can protect themselves from um, when, if they choose and when they choose to have um, a sexual relationship with a partner, whether or not that is anal sex um, or um, penetrative sex or oral sex. Who decides what's appropriate? Um, parents decide what's appropriate. Against four, parents overwhelmingly do not agree that this legislation is appropriate. I never saw um, people in my community so active like since yesterday. I got so many phone calls of parents who are concerned. A lot of parents are very concerned about talking to them um, so explicit about different things. Uh, they, they don't think that the children at sixth grade are adequate to talk to them about it. 
you can't help but feel bad for that lady. Uh, she doesn't want to say anything too explicit, but how do you talk about this without being explicit? So, Pleasure-based sex education, said sponsor Mac. Doesn't that make your skin crawl? Why doesn't it make her skin crawl to be discussing sexual pleasure and how to achieve it for children? Masturbation, queer sexualities, anal sex. It's nice to see the parental pushback and it's nice to know that this bill failed, but this should never have occurred as an idea in a lawmaker's head in the first place, let alone be proposed as a piece of legislation. Uh, all right. So in the last block, of course, we talked about America's obsession, our race mythology. Here's a view from Hollywood actress Jennifer Lewis, who is the star of the sitcom Blackish. Black people don't want to fight you. We, all we want to do is feed our children mm -hmm. and be equal. But honey, white people are scared. They're becoming a minority. The world is brown. Yeah. And they're going to do everything they can to stay in those gated communities, not pay taxes, and put those niggas in their places, and get those wetbacks out of this goddamn country. We own this bitch. Well, guess what? You will not win. Because love is the answer. Is it now? Love is the answer? That sounds very loving, Miss Lewis. That's Disney wicked queen narcissism right there. White people are scared. The world is brown. Listen to her contempt. Listen to how she fantasizes about what she believes are the dark impulses of white people. And they're going to do everything they can to stay in those gated communities, not pay taxes, and put those niggas in their place. And get those wetbacks out of this goddamn country. We own this bitch. Yeah, I can do your voice too, sweetheart. It's cheap and easy. This is what is inside Jennifer Lewis's mind not someone else's mind, not the minds of the average white person. She wants to own this country. She wants to put white people in their place. There isn't one twentieth this much animosity from your average white person to black people as we hear from black people about whites every single day in America. Who does she think we, what kind of creatures does she think we are, white people? We all live in gated communities. We don't pay taxes. We want to put black people in their place. Why? This is ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. You know what else is ludicrous? There is a better chance that this small show, this small podcast, that I will get flack from the audience or I'll get put up on social media or I'll get some kind of violation ding on YouTube because I used black lady voice. Then there is any chance that anyone in this country will talk back to this famous actress who can get up and have her voice broadcast to millions of people saying the most vile and disgusting, degrading, dehumanizing things about white people. When are we going to come to Jesus about that? All right. Finally, this week, a message from the sponsor that we wish we had. This is my truth. Trans, proud, and powerful. It's how I feel, not how you feel about me. Beyond the surface, we're all people. I can't get past the surface, though. Look at my man hips. Look at my man hips. You can't define me. 
I define myself. <laughs> yes, I can. You're crazy. Nothing can hold you back. They can never break your spirit. The time is now. Scent of a woman. The original pheromone formula for trans women. Now available for purchase online at estravana.com. Snips. <laughs> scent of a woman <laughs> I'm going to recycle this story because some of you haven't heard it but it's perfectly appropriate this commercial reminds me of time my freshman year college class in 1995 on gender and sexuality in sub-saharan Africa and it, it, this, yes this was 1995 and we were already learning back then about trans and different genders and how gender had nothing to do with biological sex. So this week, our reading was a short ethnography of tranny male prostitutes, lady boys who dressed up as women and plied their craft at the shipping docks in some cultural, coastal African country. I don't remember which one it was. It was one of those that had the language. Um, these boys claimed that they enhanced their realness and their ability to pass with their rough trade male customers by opening a can of tuna fish and rubbing the oil on their loins. <laughs> you think I'm making this up? I am not making this up. I probably still have that book. If I do, I'm gonna find it and bring it in. So <laughs> when we were talking about this in class, I lost it. I was having none of this. I, I could not stop myself. I just burst out in class and I said, oh no, they didn't. Everyone knows pussy doesn't actually smell like that. And then our professor, Mary, a proper middle-aged British lesbian anthropologist responded, and as everyone knows, Josh, you're an expert on pussy.